May only the truth be spoken here. May only the truth be heard. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's wonderful to be back among you after my bout with a car accident and COVID last week. Uh, thank you all for your prayers and well wishes. And a special thanks to everyone who stepped up and stepped in last, at the last minute last week to offer worship in my absence. Now, I got to watch the service in real time from my couch last Sunday. And I was very moved by the quality and beauty of what this community offered to the world through the wonders of technology. Now, the CAT survey, which you all took and you'll hear something about at annual meeting, revealed that one of the strongest gifts Christ Church has to share with the world is inspiring worship. I've experienced that every Sunday that I've been here. But last Sunday, I got to experience it in a different way. So well done, everyone. Today is the annual meeting Sunday at Christ Church. Annual meetings, the one time in each year that Episcopalians come together to do our congregational business. After worship, we're gonna regather back here in the church to do several important things. We'll hear reports from your leadership on the year that has passed with thoughts about the year ahead. We will also elect members of the congregation to lead us as we go forward. This is important work in any season, but especially during a time of transition. So as rector, I get to go first and offer my reflections on the state of Christ Church during this first five months that we've been together. But before I do that, I'd like to thank you for the warm welcome and support that I have received as I've taken on this work with you. This is my first interim position, and the learning curve, frankly, has been pretty steep. And you have been unfailingly gracious, doing whatever you can to help me succeed in this role. So thank you. Now, to the State of Christ Church. You know, I've been thinking and praying about what to share with you today, and I realized at one point that I had about 20 sermons worth of material to share with you. So wardens, uh, sorry, but I think my promise to keep it short probably is not going to get fulfilled. So everybody settle in. I promise it's not 20 sermons, but it might be a couple, all right? I did, however, manage to distill my thoughts down to two statements, which I will make and then expand on as succinctly as possible. Statement number one. Dear people of Christ Church, you have critically important internal work to do before you call a new rector. When I met with your wardens and then your vestry before being called as your interim, I asked them an important question, I think. I said, tell me who Christ Church is today. I had a particular reason for doing this. You see, I knew who Christ Church was when I was a member of this parish from 1977 until I left to go to seminary in 2005. For most of those years, Christ Church had a distinctive identity as a charismatic and evangelical church in the Episcopal tradition. Now I realize that is not who Christ Church has been for all of its 160 plus years but it was your identity during my years here. However, when I worshiped with you several times after I retired in 2022, I got the sense that you would not identify Christ Church in that way today. So I was curious about what had shifted, and I asked. And frankly, I did not get a clear or compelling answer. My sense was that different leadership folks had different answers, but there was no one 
unifying sense of who Christ Church was now. From what I've been told and what I've experienced, you have not reflected on your unique identity as Christ Church Fitchburg in a long time. The other conversation that has not happened at Christ Church for a long time is about your purpose. Why does Christ Church exist? What's your reason for being? Is Christ Church here because you've always been here and somehow assume you'll always be here? You know, there was a time when culture would have supported that assumption. But I'm reasonably sure you all know that those days are over. So all the more reason to know your why as a faith community as you go forward. I'm going to go out on a limb here and offer you an illustration as to that point. It's interesting to, to see what's still left around when you come back after 15 years. So I was really surprised to walk into the reception room when I first got here and find this gem hanging on the wall. Anybody recognize it? A couple folks. Anybody seen it before? Okay. I recognized it right away. This is the mission and vision statement that Christ Church put together, and I was part of the group that put it together, back sometime in the 1980s. It's not bad. It's pretty good stuff. 1980s. Now, more telling than that is look on your bulletin on the front page under where it says Christ Church Fitchburg. The statement to be and to make disciples. Y'all seen that, right? That's your tagline. 1980s. That was created in the 1980s at the same time we did this. Now, I understand, my friends, in talking with people, that you have had discussion about your mission and your purpose and your identity since that time. But there's no evidence of it anywhere hanging on the walls. Think about that for a minute. Now, please understand that I don't say this to be critical of your current or former leadership but I believe it needs to be said because dealing with the issues of identity and purpose are critical not only for your work of calling a new rector, but also for your survival. So now is the time. The diocesan transition process is intentionally shaped to give you the opportunity to have those critically important conversations about identity and purpose. First, the good news is that you've already started that conversation when you participated in the CAT survey and the profile team will be sharing about the results of the CAT and opportunities to continue that conversation during the annual meeting. So stay tuned and get involved. During the annual meeting, the wardens and treasurers will also be presenting information about Christ Church's financial situation. And it will be challenging to hear. And to be sure, the finances also have serious implications for the rector search and for your survival. So listen carefully and consider your role in these fiscal matters soberly. But I would implore you strongly not to allow the financial challenges to be the only thing or even the primary thing that matters as you discern what's next for Christ Church. I implore you because you matter. You matter to God 
and you matter to a world that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ as only the people of Christ Church Fitchburg are uniquely equipped to proclaim it today. I know this is true because I was someone who experienced the good news of Jesus Christ right here among you in a way that transformed my life. And if you could do that for me then, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do that for someone today. So please, give yourselves, give your leadership, the time and the space and the grace to do the deep, critical work of discerning who you are and why you exist as Christ Church today and what resources you'll need to be all that God has called you to be. And trust God is with you in it. Which leads me to my second statement. Dear people of Christ Church, as you do this deep and necessary work, trust and rely on God who loves you and who leads you. In this morning's first scripture lesson, we hear the prophet Isaiah speaking a word from God to the people of Israel who are in a place of deep despair and distress. God's chosen people had been defeated in war, taken captive by their enemies, and forcibly removed from their land. This is the time of the Babylonian exile. They have lost everything that matters to them as a people. But in this place of distress and despair, they wonder aloud if God has forgotten them. And Isaiah gives a voice to their fear. Why do you say, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? In truth, it is the people of Israel who have forgotten. They are suffering from a severe case of theological amnesia. So God speaks a powerful word through Isaiah to help them remember who they are and whose they are. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Have you not been told it from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Isaiah paints a picture of God, Israel's God, in all God's transcendent glory, creator of all things, full of incomparable wisdom and power. But that's not the whole picture. Their God, who is creator of the innumerable stars, also knows each individual star by name and makes sure not one is missing. This God, their God, is also imminently and intimately related and connected to all of creation. So if God will not forget a single star, surely God will not forget God's beloved people, Israel. And God promises to strengthen and renew Israel in God's time. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, when I'm anxious and stressed, I can suffer from a bit of theological amnesia myself. I begin to think that I am on my own to figure things out because, you know, God is too busy with more important things to do. And what results from that line of thinking is usually not good for me or for anyone else. Anyone else ever struggle with this? Maybe just a little? Well, guess what? Churches do too. When the anxiety is high and when, at, when what's at stake seems ultimate, we can have our own bit of theological amnesia. 
you know, like right now. But my friends in Christ, we need to remember that we are God's beloved, too. God has not forgotten us. God does not expect us to figure out what's next for this congregation on our own. Rather, God is calling us to wait for the Lord, to gather, to pray, to share, and most important of all, to listen to one another. That's where the spirit can be heard. So that we can be renewed and strengthened to be God's church as God wants us to be for the life of the world today. So my dear ones, as we speak and listen and think and pray in the days to come, may we always wait for the Lord with patience and hope. Amen.